So today, we're not doing that. Today, we're celebrating the, the B in LGBT. So we have a great program. Can you all hear me without this? Yes, yes. yes. thank you. We have a great program tonight. Uh, I'll use my outside voice. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's put on by Knox Inman, who's uh, the lead organizer at yeah. the DC Center, right? Well, for, or for the bisexual community. For the bisexual yeah, community. For the center by bisexual community. Right. And he's actually the head person in charge of making sure that every all the T's were crossed and all the I's were dotted. <laughs> Everybody else who's participating in this event knows that that is the absolute truth. So we should give him some applause. Thank you. Uh, we, we wouldn't be able to do it without you and, uh, and Sage here. So okay. it's been a team effort. It's been, it's been a team effort, but he's the T of teams. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce, we have some of our board, Sage has some of its board members here. We have Kelsey. Kelsey, you want to raise your hand? Hi, I'm Kelsey Walton. Hi, I'm Jamie Arthur. And we have Aaron. Hi, Aaron. And so we have every we do this every fourth Monday, and it's various topics. Uh, we did uh, domestic violence, LGBT violence. We're doing a intergenerational um, conversation with Smile next month. So I hope you all will um, come back for that. Uh, and we have a raffle, as many of you saw. So uh, we'll draw for that uh, at the end of the day. And I'm going to turn it over to Knox. Again, I'm glad you are here. Well. Thank you. I'll probably, that's. You don't need yeah, to. Yeah. Can you all hear, hear me without the microphone? Sure. Can yeah. we use it? Or, I can use that one. I think it might be because the microphones are so close, close together. together. So you can try it. Sure. How about that? No, 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 no. Is it it's supposed to be on. Oh, how, how's, how's this voice? Can y'all hear? Fine. Right, we're good. Awesome. Well, welcome. Okay. Thanks for everyone coming out tonight. As you know, it's Bisexual Pride Awareness Day. Well, tomorrow is, but this is our key off to the week. We're going to kick things. Uh, get, it's our kickoff, so to speak. We're doing a week of events, really. And uh, I just want to say thank you for coming out. All right, that's it. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> but I do appreciate it. <laughs> everyone coming out here. So, are you all ready? Yes. Yes. Oh, come on. Yes. All right, bisexual pride. Come on. Yes. <laughs> My name's Knox Enman. And I am currently the head organizer of DC Center's Center by Bisexual Community. And I'll give you just a little rundown about myself. Um, I was born in Tennessee, born and raised there. And when I was a kid, I didn't know anything about bisexuality. I didn't hear anything about it. There were no LGBT groups in my school. And I knew though from an early age, I mean, I knew from my teens when I was a kid that I was attracted to more than one gender. I mean, I, 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 I could figure it out, but it was confusing. I had no one to talk to. And as time went by, I'd call it different things. I'm open-minded sexually. Maybe, you know, start using the B word a little bit, open-minded slash bi, whatever. But still, there's no one, really, no one really talked to about it. And so then around 12 years ago, I'm, I'm a veterinarian. So about 12 years ago, I'm doing surgery, and I'm... Um, some little animal, and it's me and the tech, and I knew the tech pretty well. And so we're having a conversation about something or other while I'm doing surgery, and she looks at me and comes out blue and says, well, Dr. Truman, I think you're bisexual, I really do. So <laughs> that, that was kind of the moment, okay, uh, do I admit it, because I've never told anyone, or do I deny it? She says, no, no, I, you know, I, you're right, I am. And I told a few others at work, and then others, of course, it's a small clinic, so others figured it out or heard, you know. But, Beyond that, it was still kind of quiet. I mean, no, most people didn't know. And a few years ago, I told my oldest brother, he's out in Oregon, told him. And my attitude with my parents was, well, if they asked me, I'll tell them, but I wasn't going out of my way to. And, you know, and as the years went along, 
you know, I recognized, hey, you know, I'm bi, but it's confusing sometimes, you know, because you sometimes feel, you feel both, you know. On one hand, I find this woman really attractive, they have these in, in this intense gay fantasy, and then you feel both pulled back and forth. A few times, I tried to tell myself, okay, I'm just going to say I'm gay. That lasted a few minutes. <laughs> and then I started thinking about, like, Natalie Portman or someone. Okay. <laughs> you know, I know, come on. We're all, you know, most of us are by here. Who doesn't like Natalie Portman? <laughs> if there's any proof that I'm by, there you go. <laughs> so, I'd get back to, okay, well, yeah, I'm by. But it, it was hard not having anyone to talk to. And so last summer, May, um, I was checking around trying to find any groups or anything. And I live in Maryland, so I checked the LGBT community center in Baltimore, and they didn't really have anything for people to buy. And so I got on meetup.com, that's where I found the, uh, the center by group. And so I joined them in May, and then um, the women's group was doing the uh, Pride Parade, and they let some of the co-ed bi people uh, join. So I marched in the parade for the first time in D.C. I had seen the parade, but I never marched in it. So that was cool. That was a good experience. And then uh, around the fall, a fall of uh, last year, I started organizing the monthly brunch. And then beginning of the year, the original organizer, Abby, Abby uh, who uh, we owe a lot to starting that group, uh, turned it over to me. And so now I'm the head organizer. So we all know bisexuality is hard and confusing and to be very lonely and isolated. And I'd like to think that events like this will hopefully, as time goes by, help change that and educate people and educate awareness of what bisexuality is, that we're still good people, you know, uh, dispel a lot of stereotypes, we can still be trustworthy, uh, we're not confused, you know, we're not screwed up. Um, because it is hard when we deal with we deal with misunderstanding and discrimination sometimes from both sides, and we all everyone in the LGBT community sadly expects it from members of the straight some members of the straight world. Some we we know that. I mean, there's going to be some that just aren't going to be comfortable with us, and we know that. But I think it hurts a little bit more when it comes to a, from a fellow LGBT. You know, I think it hurts a little. Bit. And I hear with our group and our monthly brunch that our group has, I hear that I hear the accounts from people in college, from people in their 60s, and I hear it repeatedly that those stories of not being made to feel welcome sometimes by members of the gay community. Now we gotta remember, it's only individuals, it's not all. It's only individuals. And that's what we always have to remember, because a great many are very supportive. But as we come out more and we show our visibility more, I think that'll hopefully help change things so that we are more accepted and more understood. Now tonight, this is being put on by multiple groups. SAGE is one of them, and they've been a big help. This is, as you say, this is their uh, Monday, fourth Monday meeting, and they're allowing us to uh, use this meeting plan. We're very grateful. Um, of course, DC Center is center by. And several uh, people, John, Simone, and I here have been very helpful with that. Um, of course, uh, Sterling, you've been a been big help man from the D.C. Mayor's office. Appreciate it. Ambie. <laughs> now you can leave. You can go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was, I was actually talking to Sterling. He can go. Um, Ambie uh, and A. Billy has been a big help. He's running late. He'll be here. Alliance of uh, multi uh, Multicultural Bisexuals, and of course, uh, Siobhan, thank you for helping spread the word with DC Bi Women. So it's been a group effort. It's a coalition, and I think um, coalitions can be strong, and bringing people together and different groups together can make us a uh, stronger and a better community. So we've got multiple things for you tonight. We've got Sterling from the Mayor's Office to make a proclamation behalf of the mayor's office. And we have two speakers, Ellen Rustrom, who's here, and Faith, who is a little tardy. <laughs> but she should be. So, let's get the ball rolling. Sterling, 
Air, uh, well, I'll introduce you. You know, I just, I guess. I gotta give you a hard time a little bit, man. Come on. <laughs> Sterling really is a hard worker. And I do wonder when you actually take time off. I hope you do every once in a while, but uh, I, I figured it's probably not very often. Yeah. You know. Sterling is the director of the uh, Office of GLBT Affairs for the DC, Washington, D.C. Mayor's Office. And you can imagine he's busy. But he's been involved with the community and serving his country for years. He got his BA in political science at George Washington University. And then, if I read this correctly, you're a bachelor's of music, right? Yeah. All right, got it. Uh, from Howard University. Not an overachiever, are you? No, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> he uh, did some work with the Clinton White House, also with the U.S. Department of Labor. He's also worked with numerous other organizations and firms, always keeping in mind the LGBT community and how we can help. And I know he's busy because last Thursday night, DC Center was having a fundraiser, and yeah, he was there. <laughs> and then Saturday evening, uh, Dr. Woody, who had to leave, was doing uh, an event for uh, Mary's House, which is a house that they're uh, constructing for elderly uh, LGBT or be LGBT friendly. And Guess who was there? And of course, I'm sure you worked today, and now you're here. So, you want to come up and get the ball rolling? Sure. Awesome. Thank you, Knox. Uh, when you were saying, you know, thanks for coming out, I'm like, I come out every day. <laughs> As I'm sure so many of us do. Um, so, uh, the mayor, unfortunately, obviously could not be here tonight, uh, but he sent me in his place, uh, so I do have a proclamation from the mayor. Um, but before I read it, and I think I told this story last year. Um, uh, I'll tell it again. I'll tell it again. So, uh, when I was a student at Howard University, I started the first LGBT student, well, I'm sorry, not the first, but the uh, revived the LGBT student organization at Howard. One had, two actually had been organized and then died. Uh, so the one that I started is actually still active. And when it came time to name it, I tossed around with my co-founder a few names and we came up with Blagosa, um, which is unique um, and unfortunately leaves out the T. But that's, that's another issue. Um, but it was an acronym for Bisexual, Lesbian, and Gay Organization of Students at Howard. I cannot tell you the number of times people just assumed the beam was for black black lesbian and gay organization students at Howard. Like, you're at Howard, you probably don't need to say <laughs> But I think part of it too was like, well, why would bisexuals be in there? That that was sort of the, the thing. And I even had people question me like, bisexuals aren't supposed to be first. <laughs> you can't put them first in the acronym. And it's like, what? <laughs> um, so it just speaks to the perceived invisibility of the community and in actuality bisexuals are very much here and active and always have been an integral part of the community even though they have been largely ignored um, so that's unfortunate and I am so glad that there is now the second annual bisexual pride awareness say here in the district you never know when when movements get started, you know, it's those first couple of years, and it's like, oh, is, is there going to be a second one? Oh, there is. Oh, good. Good. This might last. <laughs> so, so, I will probably not be presenting the proclamation next year, but someone will. <laughs> so, uh, whereas the Alliance of Multicultural Bisexuals of Metro D.C. services and advocacy for LGBT elders of Metro D.C., and DC Center's Center Bi community seek to educate people about bisexual individuals and advocate for fair treatment on their behalf. And whereas bisexual individuals have a high rate of unemployment, workplace discrimination, suicide, substance abuse, depression, and other health problems. And whereas the Alliance of Multicultural Bisexuals in Metro DC, the Mayor's Office of GLBT Affairs, the DC Center for the LGBT Community, DC Center is Center by Community and Services and Advocacy for LGBT Elders of Metro DC Area 
are committed to raising awareness and ensuring access to services and resources to help meet the needs of bisexual individuals in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. Therefore, I, the Mayor of the District of Columbia, do hereby proclaim September 23rd as D.C. Bisexual Pride Awareness Day in Washington, D.C. say, I'm going to just say on behalf of the bisexual and LGBT community as a whole, we do thank you and the mayor. Because it really says a lot that a city size and prestige of Washington, D.C. would do something like this. Because a lot of cities want it. And that's true. So thank you. Thank you. Now, next. What do you think, Ellen? Okay, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> Ellen Rustrum's here from Boston, and we're very fortunate to have her here. She is a writer and an editor, uh, often focusing on women's uh, educational LGBTQ issues, uh, written things in uh, Huffington Post, uh, Journal of Bisexuality, and the Women's Review of Books. She is the president of the Bisexual Resource Center and executive director of Speak Out Boston. So, without further ado, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've got to do this. I love being bisexual. <laughs> How many people can agree with me? <laughs> all right. Excellent. Because you know, when you hear some of these statistics and you hear the negative stuff, you gotta like re-embrace the positive. Yeah. And you know, we are a wonderful people and we are a wonderful community. And that's what I wanted to talk to um, talk about tonight, uh, a little bit about community. Because very often, um, bisexuality gets talked about without being referenced. There were all these little planets or something out there that don't hit up, each other, hit up against each other or meet each other in a solar system. You know, we're just like off individually flying around. And we're not. And we haven't been for a long time. People have created by community. Um, social by community, political by community. Um, cultural by community, and it's so important for us to remember that. And I think part of our Bio-Awareness Week uh, can help us do that with all of the social media stuff that you're going to be seeing this week, um, retelling our history, bringing up our cultural icons, um, <coughs> talking about by men for one of the days, because by men often get lost. Um, in the discussion so often. Um, so there's going to be a lot of opportunities this week to, um, to really feel good about our community and what we've done and what we're going to continue doing. And um, last, last year at this time, a group of us, there were 33 of us, who went to the White House for a meeting. There are a couple other people here who were there um, last year. And it was a wonderful opportunity for our community, again, to, um, to address some issues in a forum that we had not been invited to before. And that it was really wonderful. And we, you know, part of it, I think, was because of Gautam Raghavan at the White House, the liaison there. He really he listened to us when we went to him and talked about the need. And in fact, um, this is embargoed, but uh, until Friday. But we're, the BRC is actually giving him a Bi Ally Award this year <laughs> because of his work. Um, he's he's recently left the White House, but um, he's going to be continuing to work in the LGBT community. Anyway, so last year we were there and um, had a had a really good discussion there, and I really feel that the energy in that room 
has really pushed us, pushed us along with such momentum to this, where we are right now. There's been a lot going on this year. And um, some of the things that started before that meeting, but I think since that meeting, it's really given some really good momentum and energy um, for people to hold on to and dig in. Um, I did, I want to mention a couple things. So the Bisexual Leadership Roundtable um, was conceived a few years ago and took a while to kind of figure out what we were going to do with it and all. And it's actually pulled together now. There is a web presence to pull people together to talk to each other. And one of the great things about the beginnings of the BLR was it was really just to kind of connect the organizations better so that people were talking to each other more and we weren't, you know, reinventing something on the East Coast that somebody was doing in Phoenix, Arizona, or whatever, you know, trying to just to talk to each other more. And that really started happening. Once we, like, said this is what we should be doing, we really did try and uh, we definitely were communicating a lot. I mean, Faith is going to be here shortly. and. Um, Faith and I, for example, Binet and BRC have been working together side by side for a few years now in, in just getting certain things done together. And, you know, we all have our little niches within the, within the movement, but we all do have to work together um, organizationally and individually. And I think BLR is a great place where um, both the organizations and individuals are getting connected. Individuals who are like out in the world and maybe don't have an activist community or a group nearby, but they can connect in with the web presence, which is really great. Um, one of the things also since last year's meeting, which the BRC has done, is um, we piloted the Bisexual Awareness Month, excuse me, Bi Bisexual Health Awareness Month. Um, in March. Did anybody observe that? Did, did anybody see stuff going out? And, yeah. Okay, a few people. Good, good. Well, we, um, we were really fortunate. I want to give credit to our intern. We had an intern, Julia Canfield, the BRC. Um, she was interning with us for two years, which is such a blessing to have an intern for two years in a row. <coughs> and she was doing a, a social work master's. And so she came to us and said, I want to do this Bisexual Health Awareness Month um, for a practicum and so it gave us such an opportunity to try that out and um, We felt it you know well went really well. We made some really good connections um, We got some good information out there and we're going to do it again And we're going to do it with much more people many more people involved um, In fact if individually anyone here wants to get involved, please connect with me Julia, again, actually, Julia has since gotten her degree, and now she's joined the board of the BRC and will conti be continuing to work with the BRC. So she is going to, um, again, sort of be at the head of that for this coming March, and um, it's going to be bigger and better. Um, one, of the pe one of the other people who was at that meeting last year uh, was uh, Judy Bradford, Dr. Judy Bradford, who works with Fenway Health in Boston. And uh, she's another one, actually, who's going to be getting a Bi Ally Award this year because she came to the BRC after the White House meeting and said, we have got to keep moving on this health research. It's so important, you know, the bi and, and, and she is, does not identify as bisexual, but she is a fabulous ally and wanted to make sure that our community keeps moving on it. So she invited us to help convene a group of bi-researchers and bi-activists who work on health issues together uh, to meet in Boston this past June. And one of the great things that came out of that meeting was be besides a lot of people who had never seen each other face to face actually got a chance to do that. Um, but we uh, started the Bisexual Research Collaborative on Health, BIRCH. And so that is going to be sort of the, the beginning of where this group of people, and that group of people is not going to stay stagnant, it's going to extend. But that was like the, the, the core group, which is then going to grow and extend into other people who were also working on Bi Health. But it was, it was fabulous to see um, even the energy that was going on in the room at that point of what ideas that were popping up already and we're working on seeing if we can then have a, a conference 
um, focused on by health. So that's in, in, the, in the workings. Um, there are two reports, actually, I'm not sure, sure if I'm supposed to mention the one tomorrow yet, but <laughs> there are two important <laughs> reports coming out this week. Um, one of them you might have seen today come out from MAP, um, has put out a, um, actually I don't have the title of it, what is it? Understanding Issues Facing Bis Bisexual Americans. And it's, it's really great. It's the Movement Advancement Project. And again, one of the women who worked on this was in that White House meeting last year. So you just, again, see the reverberations from that one meeting and things that were going on. She works for MAP, and she's an out proud bi woman. And um, she kind of got the organization to put some attention to this. And, you know, it's a, it's, kind of a basic report. It's a, you know, it's a little bit better than a by 101 cuz it's you know, it's got some important statistics, but this is really important to be able to like take to your local LGBT organization um, and and say, you know, this is important information. What are you doing to address this within our community? How are your programs and services um, serving the bi community? So that is is it's really a great piece um, to work with. And then Tomorrow, HRC is putting out a bisexual youth report. And that is, again, um, a great thing to see focused on. Um, and the really startling thing for, I think, a lot of us is, because many of us are familiar with the adult statistics now for the bi community. More recent surveys have broken out the, our community so you can see us. So we're more familiar with what's going on in the adult community. And some of the some of the really hard and, and um, sad statistics, which have been mentioned already, we can see it already starting in the youth statistics. So you you know you can really kind of connect some of the things that's, that's already happening to teenagers continues in our adulthood, um, and that's you know it's it's significant to you know to make those connections. Um, I did want to mention since we were since we're here um, and partly sponsored by Sage um, that um, and I'm not I think that's a great connection that you're building here in DC and I think it's really important for a lot more bi groups to work on LGBT um, elder issues. Um, it's something that the BRC is putting more attention to as well. I mean, definitely our own community of activists is aging. <laughs> You know, we have, so, we, you know, in Boston we have a, a, the old guard, um, and <laughs> and uh, and we want to be able to take care of our elders um, within within the same community that they ha have been comfortable in and have worked with them. So, BRC is we've been working with the LGBT Aging Project, which is based in Boston. Um, we did a, a workshop there. Um, few months ago at the uh, at their LGBT aging conference in Salem which was really great really great to make those connections and to just expose people to um, to buy perspective within that within that issue we had uh, a man in his 60s and a woman in her early 80s sort of talk about their experiences um, and and that was that was really wonderful and because there there are already reports surveys that show like I'm making the connection between the youth and the adult well the adult the 2006 MetLife study that showed that bisexuals of a, and they they were um, they were doing more of like a middle age 45 to 65 had fewer friends less likely to be out which we know from other studies that that's a very big issue um, and twice as guarded I'm not sure how they judge that, but that's how they worded it. Twice as guarded as um, gay, and, gay, lesbian, and trans people. Um, so, again, a very important thing for us to keep an eye on um, as we uh, continue working on the, on the elders. The other thing I did want to mention, because this has been something that uh, the BRC has also been working terribly hard on this year, and this is, good, this is the only copy right now in existence. This is our, our sample copy from the printer, um, but it's coming out 
this week. And if you've ordered your copy, it'll be coming to you soon, we hope. <laughs> Probably within the next two weeks. Um, but this is recognized, um, The Voices of Bisexual Men, which Robin Oakes and um, Dr. Harakuti um, co-edited. Um, he also goes by H. Sharif Williams. And um, it's a wonderful anthology of bi men's experience and perspective um, in uh, fiction, poetry, personal essays, um, just beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. So I hope, I hope you um, get a chance to, to get a copy. Order one through your library. Always important to get one on the library shelves um, so that you can enjoy it and take it out of the library and, and hopefully other people will too. So that is something else that we've been putting a lot of um, attention into. Um, one of the things that people say sometimes about uh, like the bisexual movement and they think, well, what are you really about? Right? How many times have you heard that one, Lorraine? Um, and, you know, you're always like talking about being visible and yeah, what's that about? I mean, that's not that important. And when I look at any of these reports and I see these horrible statistics and you can directly link being invisible and invalidated. You're invisible? You're Come on, sexual. babe. I can see you. I can see you. Sorry, I have to break it up, right? I can see her. No, Come no. Here. Come on. I'm so excited to meet you. Resource educator editor, like we really need to listen. So please continue. Just yeah, finish it. So it's important. So this, so when we look at these statistics, that shows to us why we care so much about being visible and being validated. Do not underestimate what that is. That being visible and being validated within this room. Hopefully just being here together tonight is going to make you feel better. Right? I hope so. I hope so. It's already making me feel better. I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> right? Right? And so just don't underestimate that and Try to explain to people the power of that and why it is important for us to share that within our community and to keep building it together. So, alrighty. That must have been a really Thank good you. question. She's really amazing, right? I mean, we're so lucky. I swear, none of the things that we've achieved in the last four years would have happened if, it, if we hadn't met in Dallas. 2010. I know. I'm not going to give you the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> don't break me. She's like, don't break me. Yeah, I mean, that was really crazy because that was the first time that we had really had that opportunity to meet as leaders of national groups in a kind of national setting. And then we we're like, oh, let's do this, let's do things together. It made it so much easier. And then just, you know, building that kind of experience of working together, that changed our community. That's what did it, right? It's like, I imagine like hundreds of, of bisexuals everywhere, like with a, a big giant like spoon just going, by the grace of God, you know, like just pulling it together because that's what it was. Uh, the bi erasure was so so crazy for the for our community. You know, I, I say a lot of times some something that's very important to me is that, you know, between like two thousand four, two thousand twelve, we lost about like six bi activists to suicide. Right? People we knew, people we were friends with, who didn't have any hope left. Right? And, and a lot of times sometimes it was older folks. Right? And, and you don't, you don't want to make any judgments on that, right? When somebody's living in pain and they're going through stuff, that makes sense. We understand that, you know? People should have, you know, the, the role, the ownership of their life. But what about the hope, right? I mean, where did the hope go for those people, right? It was gone. So it's, it's kind of amazing because now we have this multi-generational multi -generational movement, and the hope is, is 
uh, goes both ways, <laughs> you know, right? Of course. Between the young people, <laughs> right, and some of the older. The binary still exists, right? And so if people are feeding off each other in a really good way, right? Like somebody was like, eat the young, right? They're creamy and tasty. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. that seems a little too far. <laughs> I don't know. How many people want to... Um, let's not fall. Uh, <laughs> right? Because people were like, listen, I mean, when it comes down to it, I kind of... I wouldn't mind. You know, but I think that that's a, a big part of it. So, I guess my pr presentation is being set up. Yeah. Awesome yeah, lady of right power there. in the back. Oh, is he coming we're up here? It's yeah, coming up there. right there. We got hooked up. No, you can here. stay, please, please. Oh, no. oh, you want to be able to see? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'll see this a million times. Thing, and then, uh, We'll get a question and answer for cool. everyone at the end. But we do it during the middle. We're, we're, we're easy. Yeah, how many, you guys like to ask questions during stuff? That's fine. Yeah. Sure. People like that? Sounds good? I think it's, uh, it's oh, okay. again, more than one way is, is something that we use. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like if you can't, right, if you don't want to. Trying to insinuate we swing both ways. Uh, you know, two is such a limited idea. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, mean, I think that's a, a, a big part of what we're talking about with bisexuality. It's this evolution of concept of sexuality. Um, so that's really important. Let's. See. Okay, cool. So I've got like my little presentation. And I've got like this thing that may work. <laughs> So um, I'm going to start off, I'm going to just try to keep this short and stuff. So this is available on the Binet USA website, um, so you can download it and copy paste. It's a PowerPoint so you can actually use it in your, for whatever purposes you see fit. Um, but I start off talking a little bit about important moments in Binet history. Because a lot of people don't know that bisexual history goes back before so long. So one of the first big um, gay icons and also a bi icon was Stephen Donaldson who um, helped start the, the Student Homophile League in 1966 at Columbia. So it's considered one of the first public gay groups. It's also the first gay student group for sure, so we know that. And then later, a few, a few years down the line, he kind of felt forced out when he had like a torrid love affair with one of the co-founders of the lesbian civil rights group. <laughs> <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so he, he left, right? He left, he um, became a great uh, leader of the pacifist movement, and he actually was one of the, the, the people who pushed forward with the Quakers to release the first um, statement about bisexuality, which was the first uh, you know, religious statement about bisexuality in 1972. So you know, it's really interesting. So then we of course have Brenda Howard, who's in New York, who helped conceive and, and basically think up this idea of let's celebrate our resiliency and our survival with pride. Um, and lots of other, you know, A. Billy S. Jones, Hennon, is, was a logistics coordinator for the first National March on Washington for lesbian gay rights. He actually um, stepped down the weekend of, I believe, was it, right, to keep doing the Third World Conference, which was happening at the same time. So there's like this great thing that's going on with all these organizations that are gay rights actually being inclusive of everybody, right, up to a point. So it's kind of like the history of the LGBT community is also the history of biphobia, the history of transphobia. So going through this history is really important. Um, another great moment, 1984, Dr. David Laurier persuaded the San Francisco Department of Health to recognize bi men for the first time in their official AIDS statistics. Up until that point, many bisexual men were dying but were not acknowledged because they, it was a gay disease. So they said, you know, we really don't want to talk about bisexuals. It's one of the reasons why it looks like um, one of the great uh, bisexual activists in San Francisco, Maggie Rubenstein, is considered the, the mother of sex education. Coming out of that, a lot of our organizers and activists were involved in the 80s and uh, HIV and, and having a conversation about it, saying, hey, we've noticed this is going to be a problem for us, right? Acknowledging that. That's something that bisexual people do. So we have that kind of great history going on. We also know that the word bisexual itself has a really important significance. So one of the, some of the things we talk about from the 1990 Bisexual Manifesto were some folks who were thinking about this, saying, what do we need to say to get people to understand our identity? So they said it's a whole fluid identity, 
Don't assume anything about it, really. In fact, nothing should really be assumed about anyone's sexuality, right, including your own. It's a really kind of thoughtful exercise there. That's 1990, so we kind of say bi hasn't been binary since 1990 at least. Of course, the definition that most people use these days is Robin's, Robin Oaks, who's an esteemed gender and sexuality expert. So she says bisexuals are people who acknowledge themselves the potential to be attracted romantically and or sexually to people of more than one sex, but not necessarily at the same time or in the same way or to the same degree. Right? People go, well, that's a lot of people, right? It is. It's actually a lot of people. So <laughs> we, <laughs> turns out, <laughs> whoa, it's a lot of people. Um, so we know that the coming out experience is different. This is a great picture from last year when, um, before we went to the White House, we met at the task force offices just around the corner, across the street. Yeah, and um, so this was all of us together before we went to, to present evidence um, and testimony to the federal government about bi issues. So some of the things I tell folks about the coming out experience, it's different. A lot of bi people come out later in life, right? There's more of an acknowledgement that sometimes you're going to have a relationship and then you're going to come out later, right? Because guess what? Most people have more than one relationship in their lives, right? So for bi people, thinking about their relationships is a big part of their identity. Um, and we also say that kind of thinking about all of your identity is something we call identity maintenance. That you have to do it to be healthy. Right? You have to actually think about, how am I being bi today? Right? And, okay, so Lorraine, how are you being bi today? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lorraine, <that's okay. laughs> really good thing for us, right? It's one of these things people, well, how do you guys see them? You're invisible. <laughs> Guess what? The bisexuals are all about showing it off, right? Let, let's, let's have, let's do conversate about that. So labels are really important to us in that regard. We consider bisexual kind of a community label. Some people also call it an umbrella term. Um, but at the same time, you know, I tell people, it's like, oh, I don't know so much about umbrella terms. You know, umbrella terms kind of are meant to keep the rain off, right? Bisexual brings it, right? When you say, I'm bisexual, people go, why did you say that to me? I don't know why you said that to me. <laughs> I had something, I was not expecting that. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> does, that happen, does that happen to you? <laughs> oh, good. It's just me then. <laughs> yeah, so basically we see people identifying as different ways. Personal identity labels, right? So pansexual, fluid, queer, non-monosexual. At this point, there's actually 26 different bisexual identity terms. And what we realize, too, is that they vary from region. So all across California, people use fluid or sexually fluid. It's a very LA, California, Portland, fluid, fluid. Uh, omnisexual, polysexual, multisexual, East Coast, pansexual, Midwest. So you get these people, people using different terms in different ways over the course of bisexuality. So it's something that's actually a community exercise. When, it's, when we talk about gay and lesbian groups as well, you know that gay folks have these conversations too, right? Queer is not a word that some elder gay and lesbian folks really appreciate. Where some younger people, that's their identity. So we understand that those type of things are, are internal conversations. This is a poll that uh, the BICAST did about earlier this year and found that you know the majority of bisexuals, most polls of this nature, do show that most bisexuals I, I see themselves as non-binary in their attractions um, and do use this term bisexual. So but I, I do you know, want to clarify that you know, when you're talking about pansexual and somebody says, well, I'm pansexual, many young people identify that way. That's good, right? And sometimes they'll say, well, this is what it means to me, right? And a lot of times we find that they don't get validated when, they, when someone says that. They go, I, I am pansexual because I believe that all love is love. People go, well, you can't really believe that, right? <laughs> it's like, no, they really can. They're pansexual. So there's some really cool stuff that can go on with our community. But we have to be very careful not to identity police. You know, when we use the term bisexual, a lot of times I always stress to people, use pansexual, use fluid, use queer, non-monosexual. Reference those in your work, right? But, you know, be very thoughtful about how you do it. Knowing that this is a huge community. So some of the issues that affect us are based off the fact that there are so many bisexuals. This is a whole bunch of surveys from the, that the Williams Institute uh, wanted to showcase a while back, just showing that internationally and in the U.S., bisexuals have a really consistent, you know, large number, 
right? It's, it's pretty consistent across the world. Uh, a 2013 study saw 40%, and you know we know that Williams Institute data shows up to 51%. So it's really important to use the word bisexual when collecting that data. And then when you're doing anything by, talking about what that means is really great and helps a lot. I call it a bi-claimer, but you know, <laughs> I was like disclaimer, and I was like, sounds so negative. You don't want to disclaim your bisexuality. So I was like, it's a bi-claimer. Who knows what that'll stick. But the term bisexual will be used as an inclusive term to mean romantic and or sexual attraction to more than one gender and includes pansexual fluid, omnisexual, or queer self-identifications. So, so talking about why it's important to talk about us, right? Some of the things that we know over the years that we've seen now is that the health of bisexuals is pretty poor. In fact, it's much poorer than heterosexuals and poorer for the most part than gay and lesbian people. So higher rates of tobacco use, something we see a lot. One of the things that's interesting too is that bisexual women have the highest rate of smoking of any subgroup ever studied. So 30% bisexual women smoke to 6% of everyday folks, right? So it's like, okay, higher rates of anxiety and mood disorder. Bi women often don't have cancer screenings, which is unfortunate. There's a risk factor again with the, the tobacco, right? It's two things meeting in the middle, not a good way. And then more risk factors for heart disease. So we also know that bi folks have a lot of issues with mental health. Some bi people deal with this uh, by creating really fun memes. <laughs> so, keep calm, I'm bisexual and bipolar. <laughs> yes, you know. So we, we do see people talking about this online. That's one of the good things about this data, right? It's like overwhelming sometimes about how bad the data is. But then it's like, cool, bisexuals know how to check a box. Right? A whole bunch of bisexuals said, oh, that, that happened. Yeah, that happened. Oh. <laughs> Now that happened twice, right? <laughs> like, that was, right? Like, that's what happened, right? So that happened over the course of decades, giving us this wealth of data, right? And it helped, you know, legitimize LGBT health, right? We know that. When we, people talk about the it's, It Gets Better project, we know that bi people are more likely to think about suicide. Um, and bi women, of course, having this really high rate of PTSD something as well. So bi women and bi men have this really extraordinarily high rate of suicidality, thinking about suicide. Um, something that might tie into that, bi women are an incredible rate, have a really high rape rate. So much so that I actually looked at other countries and conflict areas, and you know, in India where they're having this really huge issue with um, you know, women being safe there, in some areas of India, it's 28%, too high, right? Some other areas of the world have 30% who have active conflict. Well, so when you look at a number like 46% of bi women report being raped in their lifetime, you know that's huge, right? You basically have a better shot at getting raped as a bi woman in the US than anywhere in the world. What does that say? Why is that happening? Right? We know trans folks also have a huge high risk of sexual assault. There's a vulnerability there. Right? So 50% of trans people say they've experienced sexual assault at some point in their life as well. Something extremely interesting too is that age of first completed rape it starts to give us an idea about how we can actually structure some interventions. So most bi women, and this is where the rape joke is not funny, but it was like, I don't know, it's at least a relief, I don't know. But after the age of 25, basically no bisexual women get raped for the first time. Ever. So you don't have to do like, like whistles and like stranger danger, right? It's all about re-victimization, right? And we'll have anecdotal evidence where women will say, you know, I didn't want to, but it was so much nicer than the last time somebody did that. And you're like, oh my God, that sucks. That's horrible, right? But it tells us a story about bi women and bi men and some other unique individuals. It says that having those sexual assaults and that early childhood sexual abuse changed the course of those folks over their lifetime. Right? And we'll see a lot of people say about bi women, oh, that girl, she's just crazy. Right? And she is actually probably a little crazy. Right? A little, she's handling some mental health crises. But that doesn't mean that her life is done. Right? Because we also know that bi people, again, are checking that box. That means that there's a resiliency factor. Right? So someone could, like myself, survive, you know, five sexual assaults before I turn 15. Okay? The last one, I gained like 200 pounds. 
I was like, you're never doing that again, <laughs> right? And that's what happened. That was my story. But through the course of my life with therapy, activism, taking back the night, talking about my life, I was able to regrow a really positive sexuality with my husband. So my husband's straight, but he works at Grindr, which is really hot. <laughs> Like Brian, I don't know if everybody knows how it works, but so you open up the app, and it's like this line of these lines of boys and pictures of them, and it's so attractive. And so like I like okay, so I had to promise not to like hook up with any of the boys in five years, because you know I love gay men. Anyway, but it's one of these things that it changes how we look at our sexuality when we're recovering from sexual violence. We know that sexual violence is something that happens a lot in the LGBT community too, right? So gay men report a really high level of sexual assault other than rape. We know that also there's a lot of domestic violence, right? So some of the, again, these kind of early assaults, this mental health issues, that we know that that can create risk factors, right? And that's really what we're talking about. People say, well, why is it so bad for folks like who are bi? And I'm like, the thing about it is, you know, we just don't talk about bi people, right? That's all we have to do. Somewhere along the line, perpetrators got the idea, there's one group we never talk about, right? Those are the folks that get fucked with. Excuse my language, right? I mean, that's that's what happens. So we know that talking about bi people, identifying bi youth, saying that's okay. You could be whoever you want at six years old, eight years old. But we have to start seeing that earlier for some of those folks who are going to go and grow up to live some of these lives, not realizing that they had that risk factor. That's kind of where my black superpower comes in, right? Because I'm a black woman. So growing up, I was I knew there were things I was at risk for, right? If I go to the store and I have a, a disagreement with the manager, I could go to jail, <laughs> right? Or I could just go to jail any day because the cops just decided to put me in jail. Okay, you're not in the back. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So I mean, you know, this is like a black person's life, right? This is all the things that affect us in a way that is unfair. It's just not right. So it's funny because sometimes I say, oh, that helps with being like, bye. Because I can tell people, this isn't right. This isn't fair. You don't have to live like this. But we have a right to ask for resources. Some of the stories we talked about at the White House, a person who was turned away from both a gay and straight shelter. Right? She said, wouldn't it be great if we designed services with bisexuals in mind? Right? They would be responsive to heterosexuals and gays, right? Both. Which I thought was very novel. I was like, see, there you go. It's a way to answer things. Make it for bisexuals, and then everybody else will get it taken care of, too. Uh, I was like, I don't know if that'll happen, but uh, all right. Poverty levels, also really interesting. A lot of bi people, people will say, oh, I think you're privileged. You have this rich life. But the reality is actually really different. We also know that's different for gay folks, too. There's a myth of gay athletes that's actually not true. That's the same for bi folks, too. So we know that that's a higher rate. We also know, going with that, our funding disparities. Again, when we talk about why are things so desperate, in some of the health and public health and public policy arenas, zero percent. Actually, I was saying it rounds up to zero, but since it's like, that doesn't happen in math. It never rounds up to zero. I was like, oh, that sounds so funny, right? It's like, it's not funny. I'm like, you're right. It's not. $84,000 out of a total of all LGBT of $771 million, right? So that's over the last 40 years. That's public and private grants. So that's anything that was bisexual specific. And that's what you kind of find out as we go along. So a lot of stuff that's been created over the years is LGBT, but it doesn't specify what it looks like for bi people in different sex relationships. It doesn't look for, look, like, explain what it looks like for bi people in same-sex relationships. There's kind of just like a, you'll just decide, and then we'll take care of you, right? But in the meantime, everybody's allowing us to check that box on the data. That's all I'm saying. So we know workplace discrimination is also really high. Anti-bi jokes are something we talk a lot about. That's a form of workplace discrimination. People making jokes like, oh, you go both ways. Now, when I make the joke, obviously it's funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's when we start to talk about cultural appropriation, right? When is it okay, right? We know that certain words in the trans community, we've had a lot of discussions about them not being okay. So as we evolve, we're gonna start asking people not to make that joke that way. Right? In that mean way that makes us feel bad and increases that stigma surrounding bisexuality. So we've got some interesting stigma things. And again, you can download this, um, this presentation. But one of the more interesting stigma studies 
was actually about 12 years ago at UC Davis, somebody decided they wanted to look at who white straight people wanted to live next to, right? Because that's, of course, who everybody wants to live next to, right? So they found, of course, white straight people want to live next to each other first. Then they were wanting to live next to other straight people. And then, you know, finally in the 60s, there were gay and lesbians. At the very bottom were bi women and bi men. So that just shows you, like, really the just harsh stigma of identifying yourself as bisexual, knowing that that's a hardship. How do you start to turn that around? Um, to say, you know, I am better than an IV drug user by a lot, actually. <laughs> um, no disrespect, obviously. So we know that addressing the stigma saves lives. This is an example of an anti-stigma campaign the Center for Addiction in Toronto did. Um, and it just says, like, hey, this is me. I'm bi. Right? It's a very simple image. You take a picture of a bisexual. They say they're bisexual. It's all of a sudden a bisexual image. Right? It's one of these things that's very difficult for the mainstream media to get. They always want to put, like, threesome pictures together. And then, like, there you go. That's a bisexual. You're like, that's not actually bisexuality. That's polyamory, which is cool, but like, we should talk about that too, not instead of. So we know that that's a big part of the, some of the recommendations we have that we want to see implemented across the US uh, and worldwide. By specific trainings, <coughs> publications, um, you know, openly affirming organizations. Right now I'm training the, alongside the LA Bi Task Force in Los Angeles, I'm training the entire staff of the LA LGBT Center on bisexual cultural competency. Um, they have a staff of over 400 folks. So we're 120 people in, which is really interesting. Um, and it's, it's a great opportunity to say, like, this is a necessity for your organization. They're formerly known as the LA Gay and Lesbian Center. And they run this really great, um, you know, center. But for years and years, bi people felt unwelcome there, in part because nobody knew anything about them. Some of the questions people would ask me were like, well, I want to check in with my client on his sexuality. So I ask him who he's dating now, because of course he's always going to be dating somebody new since he's bi. I'm like, that's not what we want to see some days, right? We want to see you checking in on the biphobia that affects his life, just as much as the bisexuality that shapes it, right? That's something a lot of people miss. They're like, oh, it's about your sex partner. It's like, no. It's about how people perceive me, right? Because of my sexuality, right? That's the biphobia. It's about how people discriminate against me or about how I'm taken out of scenarios that would save my life. So those are the really you know, basic kind of things that people say, oh, well, you know, I still, I need to talk about monogamy and that's important. Again, my husband works at Grindr. <laughs> it's an important conversation. It doesn't belong to bisexuals. Right? Everybody needs to be talking about what makes a really positive relationship. Right? You can have people be married, have partners, all that could actually work and be fantastic if you're really comfortable with it. So getting people to kind of have that conversation in the workplace, it really does start by talking about bisexuals. Right? Talking about how to reach out to bisexual communities, you know, actually kind of saying, hey, we're not going to say this is a gay group. We're going to say it's an LGBT group because we want to welcome bisexuals course, have a flag for Celebrate Bisexuality Day. Um, we have some amazing resources because of the Bisexual Resource Center. So they did a, a Bi Health Month, which I think you talked about. I did talk about, yeah. So this is a great slide from there. Um, definitely check it out. They have a whole like, just massive amounts of images that are awesome. Um, again, making sure you use bi claimers in your work or for whatever reason you can think of. Talking about people as parents in the LGBT community. This is also something really important for bi people to do too. Right? A lot of times we talk about what external like LGBT groups should be doing or gay and lesbian folks or straight people, but also for ourselves, right? To embrace our community, to embrace this history, to embrace the bad stuff, you know, and say, hey, do we have examples of people surviving it? Yeah, I mean, do is anybody here okay with identifying themselves as somebody who survived cancer? Does that happen for anybody in this room? Okay, so there you go. We've got like three bisexuals. There you go. Sexual assault, has anybody survived that? Kind of, kind of gotten through it, right? Okay. Did you stand up? Did you, you found a way to make it work, right? Yeah, you did. You did. You're here. You're here right now. You're proud. You can be it, right? So it's all about talking about 
our identities. We're gonna have to hug later though, okay? Um, <laughs> we're gonna have to. I'll come circle back there. We'll hug. So we, it's, we can talk about some resources too. There's a great uh, young bi trans activist, Odd Trayer, who's doing a survival anthology for bi folks who had sexual assault in their life, right? To talk about all those things that it's like, hey, okay, how do you make it out? Right? Because that's the story we we'll want to tell for everybody is having this really functional community that that survived, right? And then, you know, brought all the celebration and the culture and all these fun things. I would say, I'm like, okay, first let's save our lives and then stop us from getting raped. And then we can be sexy, <laughs> right? Because by people are, by nature, we are sexy, right? It, there's something that people are attracted to about us, about our free thinking, our independence, our ability to break the rules, our ability to make the rules. A lot of bisexuals are organizers. Many bi people end up having four or five or six different organizations that they work with. And people go, oh god, they can't stay focused. I'm like, are you kidding me? They can't, they're bi. This is what they do. This is their life. They go make movements, guys. Right? This happens all over the world. Bi people are creating genius. Right? We just saw a great article come out in the New York Times. Charles Blow. If you guys seen that. That's just a, right? That's a black bisexual man sharing his experience, right? Identifying his survival, right? Explaining how that works. That's, those are the type of books we need to make sure we just keep seeing come out, right? That how to, you know, get through pretty much anything as a bisexual, survive, to dance naked in the streets, perhaps. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm looking at Lorraine when I say that, but <laughs> she's always like, I'm like, together we can dance naked in the streets. I don't know if that's like, we'll pick up some good in game. It's like, you know, Disneyland, you know, I don't know. But there's something really amazing about surviving all those things. You know, a lot of people miss that component when we talk about our bisexuality. And it's important to see it not just as a threat, right, or something we have to get past or get through. Right? And that's, that's the power that we bring also to the gay and lesbian community, is when people tell us, and they say, you know, you should just be gay, it'll be easier. Right? You should just be straight, it'll be easier. It's like, no, it shouldn't be easier for anybody to be different than who they are. Right? That's just simple. So we're, we're going we're gonna to keep passing that along into the greater ecosystem of the world. You know, what it is to be straight up identified as who you want to be. Anyway, I'm Faith. Thanks for, you know.